Good morning. You might take your New Testaments and turn to Titus chapter 2. That's where we'll be looking today. I was talking to Lydia this week about my sermon, and she found out I didn't have a Mother's Day sermon. And uh, I just want to say that doesn't mean that I don't love mothers. Uh, I, uh, I just uh, had a plan in mind already and uh, wasn't uh, particularly thinking about uh, having a sermon on that sort of thing. But we do have a number of visitors here with us, and I'm sure you're here to uh, celebrate uh, a mother or you are celebrating a mother. Uh, and uh, just a day like this uh, has me thinking about my mother, and I miss her terribly. And I know a lot of you can sympathize with how I feel in that situation, thinking about your own mothers, maybe who have passed on. Uh, but I am so thankful for the mothers that we have here and for the example of faithfulness and diligence and godliness and gratitude and contentment that you are. And I know that I didn't have to leave my mother behind in order to serve the Lord. But when I think about things like this, I, I think about what he told Peter. And Peter said, we've left everything behind to follow you. And he says, there's nobody who's left behind houses or lands or even mothers or fathers who doesn't gain a hundredfold in the kingdom. And from the moment that uh, I became a Christian, it's uh, as if I gained hundreds and hundreds of mothers and examples of mothers and models of that. And then even here in this local congregation, thinking about um, the dedication that we have in so many women who have given their lives to trying to shape children to be what they ought to be. But today I want to talk about Titus chapter two, and I will mention some of those same ideas later on in the lesson if we have a moment but i want to take us to titus chapter 2 uh, because there we are going to think about uh, his grace reaches and teaches me from titus chapter 2 verses 11 and through 14. now in january we introduced the theme of titus and we introduced it as this idea that God's grace not only saves us, but it instructs us. And so we sing the song, His grace reaches me. And we talk about the salvation that that brings and the joy that we have because we have been saved by Christ. But that same song that we sing, His grace reaches me. And the chorus says, His grace reaches me. Yes, His grace reaches me. Now I'm under His control and I'm happy in my soul just to feel and to know that his grace reaches me. By coming under the grace of God, we also subject ourselves under his instruction and his teaching. And in February, we talked about the fact that Paul calls Titus, basically his first task at hand is to appoint men who are going to be gracious teachers, who will be men who, having been shaped by the grace and teaching of God in their own lives, and who meet qualifications that shows that they have been saved out of a wicked and, and terrible society and brought to something higher by God's grace and by his teaching, that we also look to them as models of that and that they teach and instruct in that. And in March, we talked about the false teachers that, that were coming to, uh, to Crete where Titus was preaching. And the danger that they face because they're bringing false doctrine, they're bringing the wrong teaching, which threatened to get people out from under the grace of God. And this was a terrible circumstance to be in. And so last time we talked about the beginning of Titus chapter two. And if you'll just look with me there, looking at those first 10 verses, you can see that there's instructions, verse two, to older men and in verse three to older women so that they can teach verse four young women. And then in verse 6, that there's instructions to younger men and that Titus is supposed to be a certain way in verse 7. And then in verse 9, that there are instructions for slaves. And so they, this is a high calling that he calls these people to. Lives of godliness and faithfulness, of diligence, and, 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 and in all sorts of ways, calling them, uh, Titus, Titus's job is to preach sound doctrine, healthy doctrine, doctrine that is to bring them to fullness and completion. And we see just a taste of that in verses 1 through 10. And today we come to what I think is the key text of the book, looking at Titus chapter 2, 
verses 11 through 14. This is from the Legacy Standard translation on the screen. And it says there in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, For, that is because the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us that denying ungodliness and worldly desires, we should live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all lawlessness and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. And that's where we'll leave off for now. Now, we come to this key text. I, I think that this not only could summarize the book of Titus and what Paul is wanting Titus to preach, but I think that there is some way in which we could say this passage could summarize the ethical, moral, lifestyle, practical teaching of the New Testament. And even if we just narrow that down to the letters of Paul, I just want you to think about how Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14 kind of summarizes the big picture of what our lives are supposed to be and why they're supposed to be that way. He starts off by saying, you older men and older women and younger women and younger men and slaves and Titus, you live this way, pointing people to God. Why? Because the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Doesn't that sound familiar when you think about the writings of the Apostle Paul? I think about Romans chapter 12 almost immediately when I think about this passage. Because there in Romans chapter 12, he says, I plead with you, I beg you by the mercies of God that you would present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. What he says is God's mercy, God's grace, God's love has appeared. It has been brought to you. And so now how do you respond? You give yourselves as living sacrifices. I think about Ephesians chapter 2 where he says, it is by grace that you have been saved and by, uh, through faith and not of works lest anyone should boast. And then in verse 10 he says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We have been saved by God's grace. We have put our confidence, our trust, our loyalty in him. And in verse, verse 10 he says, and so we respond in this way of giving our lives dedicated to good works because that's what we were made for. And so I think that if we looked at basically the second half of any of Paul's epistles, we would see those practical applications that are being made. And I think Titus 2, 11 through 14 might summarize that as well as any text in the Bible. And so while maybe you've been thinking about the book of Titus a little bit this year, I've been thinking about it for a little while, maybe this would be a good passage to write on our hearts. And I don't just mean memorize it. I do think that that would be a good practice. But if we could write on our hearts that the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, teaching us that we should deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and live soberly or sensibly, righteously and godly in this present age, that we should look for and long for and wait for the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify us to be his people who are zealous for good works. If we could memorize that and have it in our brains and then just let it sit on our hearts and meditate on that, and let that define us and who we are and what we're hoping for and what how we make our decisions. I think we would be we would be in wonderful shape. I think that would shape us in tremendous ways. The same thing would be true with like Romans 12, 1 and 2, or Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. But to me, I, I don't have a life verse that I just read to the exclusion of all others. But I think if I had one, there's a Deuteronomy 6 passage that I feel as a father. But as far as passages summarizing why and what and how and what's all this for, I think Titus 2, 11 through 14 answers a lot of those questions. I can't go into the detail of how it answers all those questions um, because every phrase almost in this passage, we can have a sermon on. But I just think this is a great capsule passage that if you just take a dose of it every day and just ponder on it, I think it will help us. So let's let's think about this. So. Why live these 
transformed lives that point to God that we read about in verses 1 through 10. He says, because God's grace is reaching you and it is teaching. So let's think about some of these phrases. For the grace of God has appeared. What does that mean? How has God's grace appeared? I think that when we think about the grace of God appearing, it is not just this kind of like sentimental, emotional aspect of God he has just kind of let us know about. The grace of God has appeared in embodied form. The grace of God appeared when Jesus appeared in the way that Paul is talking about it here in, in Titus 2. That's, that's God's gift appearing to us. When we think about the word grace, think about his favor or his gift. And in Jesus, the gift of God appeared. He comes as Lord and Savior to rescue us from the guilt and the power of sin, to forgive us and to make us part of his kingdom. So why live these transformed lives? Because of what God has done in Jesus. Because in him, the grace of God has appeared. And the next phrase is bringing salvation to all men. And you might say, brought salvation to all men? Because when you look at the rest of the New Testament, and I think as we look around at our world, I think we can practically draw this conclusion. We say, God's grace brought salvation to everybody? <laughs> to all these people? Does this mean that everybody out there is saved if it brought salvation to them? And I don't think that's the picture at all. I think that would contradict so much of what is said in the New Testament, especially like passages like Matthew 7, 13 and 14, that there are few that they, there be that find the way to life. So what does it mean? I do think that it does. It is talking about all people. Um, and the reason I would say all people, it's bringing salvation to all people is because he's just talked about old men and old women, and young women, and young men, and slaves. God's grace has appeared bringing salvation to everybody. It's on offer for you. It's on offer for me. And it doesn't matter what your social, economic, gender background is. It's on, it's on offer to you. It's been laid at your feet. God's salvation has appeared. God's grace has appeared bringing salvation to all people. And it's right there waiting for you to grab a hold of it. And I love this because this week we can celebrate, this new week we can celebrate what happened last week with people taking hold of that gift and opening it up and embracing it. And I know that there are people here this morning to whom the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to you. And the gift is laying right at your feet. And all you have to do is open. You need to think about that. You need to ponder that it is available to you and that it is waiting on you. It's a gift laid at the feet of every person and we can take hold of what Christ has done and that his salvation claim. Now, it uh, has done um, and, and we can claim that salvation. Now, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us. Your text might say teaching us, but the word there is like instruction, or training, or discipline. If, if I understand any, I don't understand much about the Greek language, but evidently this, this term is an ongoing process. It is something that I think Paul would have considered himself to be still being instructed by, that he would have still been be disciplined in the sense of being trained as a disciple by the lessons that we learn because the grace of God has appeared. We become trained in the ways of living in view of God's grace. Notice that grace is not here or anywhere else for that matter in the New Testament ever used as an excuse for non-response or dismissal of instruction. There's a lot of people in the world who say, I, I remember being somewhere one time and somebody says, well, I once was a part of the church of Christ. And they said, but then I went to a church that taught me that grace meant I didn't have to worry about all that. Man. That's not the idea of grace ever in the New Testament. The grace idea of God's grace is always that it compels us to be more than what we could have been without him. Never that we would be less than what we should be. It's exactly the opposite. And, and you know, can I pause just a minute and this be my Mother's Day lesson part right here and illustrate this. You know, mothers have authority over their teenage sons. Right? Um. But they don't always recognize that authority, do they? I remember, oh, miss my mother, but 
I remember being a teenage boy and being so frustrated. I know with my smart mouth and my disobedience. Uh, and that is a great regret. But mothers have authority over their teenage boys. Boys are told, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And they are told, right in the core commandments of the old law, to honor your father and mother, which is reported. It recorded in the New Testament as well in the Bible. Honor your father and your mother, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. She has the authority to instruct and teach her sons. But we don't always respond as well just reading the verses and saying, well, I know she has the authority to do that, so I guess I'll do whatever she asks. No, what do we do? At 15, what did I do? I rolled my eyes or I huffed, and maybe I got up and did it, but I did it with a heart that was not involved and it was not, maybe I didn't even do it. But if I did, I did it begrudgingly. But you know what I would do now? In view of the sacrifices, I've just gotten a taste of what it's like to be a parent and, and, and not at all what it's like to be a mother. And I've seen that in Lydia and the sacrifices and the time and the emotion that's involved in that and the weight and the burden, not in the sense that they're, they're a frustration, but they are frustrating sometimes. And so as, as a grown man, if my mother could call and ask me to do anything i don't think there's anything that i wouldn't sell i don't think there's anywhere i wouldn't move i don't think there's anything that i wouldn't do i would move mountains if possible to do something my mother asked why because of her grace because of her kindness because of her compassion because of the sacrifices that she made for me and even the way that i live now without her being able to ask is shaped by the things that she called upon me to do. And my boys, I hope you're listening. Are you listening? There will come a day where they will understand a little bit, I hope, of the sacrifices that their mother has made for them. And that when she calls upon them to do something, they will be there and they will answer the call because they know that hit her grace. Now, I'm not minimizing the thing mothers do at all. But that's small in comparison to the things that God has done for us in Christ. They save us. They really do. In physical and sometimes in spiritual ways, they direct us in the right ways. And we should love them and respond appropriately to them. And so when they call for obedience, I think as, as men who are grown and who still have mothers, and they call and ask us to do something, we bend over backwards to do whatever we can the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, instructing us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously in godliness. When God's love appears in that way, when he gives us that gift, when we see the sacrifice and the love and the devotion to us, the answer should never be, well, God's grace covers me so I can do whatever I want to. No. The call of God's grace is always stronger than the call of just, these are the rules and i got to check the boxes. It takes us so much further than that. God's love and grace and mercy and kindness compels us to respond in a way where we give our lives, we become living sacrifices, we become devoted people who know this is our purpose. And so we deny ungodliness and worldly lust. What does that mean? Denying is saying no to. We reject ungodliness. That, that ungodliness is living with an earth-only view, right? We don't think about the eternal. We don't think about God. We don't think about the spiritual consequences. When we live ungodly lives, we live for what's right here and what's right now. That's ungodliness. It's a earth-only level view, as if there's nothing out there past Pluto, you know? So we deny ungodliness. We say no to that way of living. 
We say no to worldly lust. That is, I'm not going to let my flesh, I'm not going to let my appetites, I'm not going to let my the parts of me that are not brought up, I'm not going to let that dictate and decide which direction I'm going to go and what I'm going to do. We deny ungodliness and worldly lust so that we live soberly. Your text may say sensibly, as the LSB says. I like the word soberly because we know what the word sober means, right? We know what the word unsober means. <laughs> Somebody who doesn't have their faculties, they don't, they don't have their senses trained. They, um, they're not really able to pick up on awkward things that they do because right? they're not sober. They don't have their senses about them. We're not supposed to live like that. We're supposed to live soberly. And I don't know that this is particularly a passage about social drinking or something like that, but I do think it's a passage that we want to be clear minded and we want to be thoughtful, and we want to be serious. So when somebody thinks soberly, that is, I go out into the world, and, and I need to be able to live with an awareness that today I'm going to face challenges, and today I'm going to face temptations. And I approach the day with that kind of seriousness. I am not just a happy-go-lucky, everything's going to be fine kind of guy. I can't be. I've got to be aware of the dangers that are around me. Uh, one one uh, person described this as kind of a keeping your eyes peeled mentality. We're always watching. We're always serious about the things that are going on around us. It's not just fun and games. We live righteously in keeping with the high standard that God has given us. We live godly. That's the opposite of ungodliness. And so when we live godly lives... We are living lives that are aware that God is watching, that he cares about every step that I take, that there is an eternity, that every step that I take reflects to some degree or another my devotion to God and to his will. So his grace teaches us, and just summarizing up verses 11 and 12, his grace teaches us shifting how we decide what guides our decision making. What guides your decision making? Ungodliness and worldly lusts? That's what people who think about only the financial or recreational or comfortable consequences of their decisions are going to be. Who let their impulses decide what their things are, what they're going to do. That's the ungodly and worldly lust. That's how most people live their lives, right? Maybe we wouldn't think of everybody as being moral reprobates, but how do they make their decisions? What's going to get me the most money? What's going to make me feel the best? What's going to make me the most comfortable? That's how they make all their decisions. That's one set of options. The other set of options is we live soberly, seriously. We are compelled by righteousness and godliness, and that shapes our decisions. The grace of God teaches us that we should reject one and embrace the other way of making our, our decisions. It's a high calling, but it is that to which we have been called in view of God's grace. And so don't let anybody tell you that we cannot live lives where we are what God wants us to be. We can. We can live sober, righteous, godly lives that we can respond appropriately to the call he has extended. I, I like that, that Paul says there, inspired by the Spirit, of course. But he says we do this in the present age. We talked a good bit the first week when we talked about Titus, the world in which they lived. The Cretans, that they were citizens of the island of Crete, I guess, that they were described as evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Um, let me, I, I'm missing one. I've got to look here. Titus chapter 1 and, uh, and verse 12. Liars, evil beasts, lazy lies. That was the world they lived in. And somebody would say, how can I do right? Somebody looks around today at 2024 America, and they say, how can I do right in the face of all this? Paul called them to live soberly, righteously, and godly on the island of Crete where there were only liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons around them. So you can live godly lives in the face of the world that we live in this present age, because this present age, while it is in fact characterized by a rejection of God and a rejection of his will, 
is also characterized by the presence of the grace of God available to you and me. Isn't that an interesting way of thinking about the present age? That right now is a terrible time to live, except we live in the age of Christ. We live in the age of his reign and his rule and know that not one of our efforts is wasted because he is key and his authority will guide us. But in this age, we live in this way. Now notice verse 13. He says, waiting for or looking for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are waiting. We are anticipating. We are yearning for. We're earnestly longing for the day of the Lord. And his grace teaches us shifting what we long for the most. Our hope is not in this present age, but it's in the hope to come, the appearance of our Lord and Savior. You know, we live in what we, we might call a now and not yet moment. We live now having salvation offered. We can take hold of that. We can be part of the people that God has called us to be. But we recognize that we're still looking forward to the consummation of all of this. We are looking forward to the full glory. And so we live like people who are longing for something more, something better. That is, we long to see Jesus. And we long to see Him because of who He is. The grace of God has appeared, but we're waiting on it to appear again. We're waiting on His appearing. The great, I, I, I love this. It, you know, we have wonderful things now. And we're waiting on something even better. And I think about the third verse of To God Be the Lord. Great things He has taught us. Great things He has done. And great are rejoicing in Jesus the Son. That's what we have right now. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. I think that's what Paul's saying right here in Titus 2. He's done great things for us. He's taught us great things. We have been shaped and transformed by the grace of God, but we are longing for a greater transformation when our God and Savior Jesus Christ appeared. Now, this Jesus, why do we long to see him? Because he is the one who gave himself for us. First, he gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. What is that idea of redemption? Oftentimes we talk about buying from slavery, and I think that is probably the best way to think about that. Can I take you to a passage? I got time. Can I take you to a passage that we uh, that I, I want to think about? And this, I think, this image, this picture is helpful. Uh, have we looked at the book of Hosea in Bible class? Yeah. So um, I'm not in the adult class, so I'm not I'm not doing a good job keeping up on YouTube either. Sorry. In um, Hosea, the idea here, um, I'll give you a minute to turn to it because I need a minute to turn to it as well. Um, you know the story of Hosea in chapter 1 where he is told to go and find a wife. But do you notice how his wife is described. In verse 2, he says, When the Lord or Yahweh first spoke to Hosea, Yahweh said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry, for the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking Yahweh, forsaking the Lord. Hosea is to go and he's to get a wife who has devoted her life to a life of sinful participation. And most of the time when that happened, it happened because the person felt backed into a corner that this was their only way to survive. And Hosea is in some way going and rescuing her out of this. I think that's the picture here. I think God is using Hosea's wife to be a picture of what Israel was. He rescued Israel out of that situation in a spiritual way. And so Hosea brings her in, brings her into his home, brings her into his, his, his care and his concern and his watchfulness. But notice what happens in chapter 3 and verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, Go again. Love a woman who is loved by her companion and is an adulteress. 
Even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. The idea there is that they turn to idolatry and celebrations of that. So we know the story of Hosea. He goes, he first rescues this woman out of this horrific way of living. And what does she do? She goes back. She goes back into that. Notice in verse 2, So I bargained for her, for myself, for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. So what does he do? He goes and he buys her back out of that. Now the word redemption is not used, but I think this is exactly the picture of redemption that's described in Leviticus chapter 25, that when somebody was in bad circumstances, they would sell themselves into slavery and then they could be redeemed from that by a relative or by a family member. So here you have Hosea as her redeemer. He goes and he buys her out of this way of life. Now, the case that I want to make is that we have been bought with a price much higher than 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley, right? We've been bought with a precious price. He gave himself for us to redeem us, to buy us out of wretched ways of life, to buy us, to redeem us from all lawlessness. When that price has been paid for us, there is no compelling reason to go back into that. Stay out of it. You've been bought with a price, not with gold or silver, but with the blood of the Lamb, as Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1. That's your purchase price. You have been redeemed from all lawlessness. And you've not just been bought from lawlessness. You have been bought in order to be a people who are for his own possession, zealous for good works. You've not just been saved from something. You have been saved to something. You have been saved for something. And that is to be his special people who are on fire. That's the root word of the word zealous. Who are on fire for good works. How do we know what good works are? I mean, first of all, we read in Titus 2, 1 through 10, what each group is kind of called to be. But it's through a lifetime of meditation on what God's grace was toward us. His good work toward us. And we think about the implications of that as we deal with others in our lives. Now, summarizing all of this, His grace has reached us and is teaching us which should shift our decision-making process, not ungodliness or worldly lust anymore, sobriety, righteousness, and godliness. It shifts the things we long for. We want to, to see the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it shifts the kind of person we are. We're not one enslaved to lawlessness. We've been redeemed. And we've been purified to be a people for God's own possession who are on fire for his work, the kinds of things he would like us to be involved in. So Titus, in verse 15, is told to declare these things with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Now Titus, as an evangelist, wasn't like one of the elders who had some kind of intrinsic authority given to him as an overseer. He was just a preacher. He was just an evangelist. That's all I am. I'm not a pastor. I'm not an overseer. I'm not a shepherd. I'm not somebody who has any kind of inherent authority in myself, except when I say what God says. And when I say that the love and the mercy and the grace of God demonstrated to you in Christ Jesus, calls you to a better way of life than you've been living. I can say that with all authority. And don't disregard it. Because one day Christ is going to appear. And we've got two options. We can long for that day, anticipate that day, wait for that day, hope for that day, yearn for that day. We can do that or we can dread its coming. And not want it to happen today. And give me a little more time. Those are our options. And they are laid before us. And because of the grace of God, everybody, because of his salvation being made available, everybody can be in the position of yearning for that day. Because you've been taught and reached 
by the grace of God. If you're here today and you want to be more shaped by what God's grace means for you, that's what all of us should want. And we want to help one another do that. So whether it's in these lessons and our Bible classes, or maybe you need more direction than that. Maybe you need specific help in areas. There are many here, our elders here are men who want to help point you in that direction and show you what it would mean to be shaped by God's grace in any aspect of your life. And we want to help you in any way we can. If you're here and you've never taken the gift of God's salvation that's been made available to you, if you've never been a part of that purified people who are zealous for good works, the grace of God has appeared. It's brought you salvation. And it's available for you to grab hold of. And you could do that even this morning. Just let somebody know that that's your desire. And you could come even while we stand and while we sing. Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.